Amen. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to First Christian Church of Cuyahoga Falls. Whether you are here in the sanctuary this morning, thank you for being out and about on New Year's Day. It is officially a holiday, and here you are, gathered to worship together. Or if you are worshiping with us online via Facebook, it's good to be together in worship this morning. I do want to wish you a happy new year today. It is a customary thing to do, so happy new year. Thank you. And I also want to recognize that we have a lot of things going on in the life of our church family right now. We have people who are facing some health challenges right now. We have folks who have lost loved ones and are grieving. And so I also want to say that if happy doesn't quite capture it for you this morning, that's okay too. If this needs to be a strong new year or a peace-filled new year uh, for you, then know that we wish you all those things as well this morning. And in that spirit, we are going to give ourselves the gift of a minute. We are just going to take a deep breath, settle in right where we are, and invite the presence of the Holy Spirit as we listen to Beth play our prelude this morning. stand as you're able and join me in our responsive call to worship. You'll see that up on the screen. A child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Amen. We are going to remain standing and sing our gathering carol, Good Christian Friends Rejoice. Can be seated. And I'll tell you, the format of our service is a little different today. We're going to sing lots of carols, and I'm going to do some brief reflections, this being the first of them. So I have an important question to ask you this morning, and it is this. Do you like macaroni? Yeah? Okay, good. If you bear with me for a couple minutes, I can make a case that it would not be entirely inappropriate to associate the cheerful Christmas carol we just sang with one of our favorite American comfort foods, macaroni. Good Christian Friends Rejoice, or Good Christian Men Rejoice, as it was originally translated, comes loosely from a Latin text, in dulci jubilo, which often actually translates sweet rejoicing. Now, when we think of Latin texts, we think of high church and cathedrals and the formal mass and maybe composers like Bach and Handel and others who wrote hundreds of works for the Latin Mass, Indulci Jubilo was not one of those texts. These lyrics belong to a category known as macaronic, which refers to the mixing of formal Latin 
with the common language of a particular people. In this case, the original text of this carol was a shameless mashup of Latin and medieval German, written sometime in the 1300s and rendered in such a way that it preserved some basic Latin elements, but smashed in enough common German words that uneducated German folks would have been able to understand it and sing it. This word macaronic wasn't exactly a compliment. Rather, it pointed to things that were of lower class or lesser sophistication. And as you may have guessed, it shares the same etymology as the word macaroni, which originally referred to the coarse and cheap fare of peasants. So this text originally was the macaroni of carols, a simple, unsophisticated song that any old person could sing. Now, over time, macaroni has come to refer to fancier and more desirable food. We now put things like lobster and truffles in our macaroni. And this hymn has come to be seen as fancier and more desirable as well. It is now commonly included in very formal church settings across Europe. It's become a mainstay in the Christmas nine lessons and carols, quite a climb from its inauspicious macaroni roots. I think this origin story is perfect for a Christmas carol. We often point out that not much about the Christmas story is very fancy in and of itself. Mary was a poor woman not even yet married into a stable situation. Her eventual husband, Joseph, was a carpenter, not a priest or a rabbi or some sort of highfalutin political leader. They lived in Nazareth, which was essentially the ghetto of first century Judea. They didn't have power or family connections, so Jesus had to be born in a stable because his parents couldn't get him a better room. And to top things off, the first visitors to see Jesus were some of the least fancy people you could find at that time, shepherds. Luke's entire Christmas narrative points to the simplicity and, frankly, the poverty that surrounded the beginning of Jesus' life. And yet from those humble roots, Luke is careful to demonstrate that power and authority emerged. Jesus possessed wisdom and insight, compassion, power, and the ability to transform the people around him, which reminds us you don't need to come from power or wealth to be powerful and rich in character. What an excellent reminder to us whenever we sing this macaroni carol, and you're going to remember it that way every time you sing it from now on, that God can work through the humblest of songs, situations, and people to accomplish great things in the world. So if you ever feel small or insignificant as though God couldn't possibly do anything big through you, eat a bowl of macaroni and remember that God uses simple things to accomplish great purposes. We are going to now share our time of prayer. And Kylie, if you'd be willing to come up and grab the microphone, we will pass it around and give folks an opportunity to raise their joys and concerns this morning. I do want to share a couple of things with you. Um, I was able to talk to Sue Harp on the phone yesterday. Jim did get his transfer. He is up at UH in Cleveland. That's great news for him. And he is awaiting surgery early this week. So this is what their family was asking for and had hoped for. And so let's just surround him in prayer as he has surgery early in the week and then will continue to be in the hospital for a few more weeks as he recovers. I also uh, want to share with you on behalf of Carrie Bullock, uh, her mother went into the ICU on Friday evening dealing with some serious kidney problems. So if we could just surround Pam in our prayers right now as well and uh, Carrie and that whole family. Are there other joys, concerns that you would lift this morning so that we can support each other in prayer? Thank you.
will surround the Swain and the Howard families with our prayers this week. All right, will you join me in a spirit and attitude of prayer this morning? Gracious and loving God, we come before you uniquely on the very first day of a new year. And I think it's a reminder to us today how often it is that you grant us the opportunity for newness, for new life, new opportunity, a new perspective, a new start. And so especially today on this day that we call New Year's Day, we just thank you for the gift of your grace, for the opportunity once in a while to wipe the slate clean, to begin a new day or a new year, um, or simply a new, a new path in our own journeys. And we ask that as we embark on 2023, that you might surround us with your grace and with your wisdom, that this might be a year in which we make wise decisions, a year in which we follow you with our hearts and our souls, our energy and our resources, a year in which we do bold and courageous things that make a difference not only in our lives, but in the lives of the community around us. We are grateful this morning to hear news of answered prayer. We're so grateful to hear that Sarah's Aunt Lynn came through her surgery well and has received a good prognosis. And we just ask that you would continue to surround Lynn with your grace and your strength, that she would continue to recover well, and that she would remain on a path to health and wholeness. And God, even as we speak Happy New Year to each other, and as we are grateful to turn the page on 2022 and to step into a new year, we also recognize that it does not erase or wipe away some of the struggles we face and some of the pain we experience. And so this morning, we wanna take the time to lift up to you people we love and care about who are facing some difficult journeys, who are hurting and grieving right now, and just ask that you would surround them with your love, your peace, and your grace, and that you would give us the wisdom and the strength to be a source of help to our friends and our loved ones when they need it. This morning, we just want to continue to surround Jim with prayer as he is going to have a very important surgery early this week. Please guide the hands of all of those people who are going to care for him so carefully and so well um, that this surgery might accomplish what it needs to accomplish and he might be back on a path toward health and wholeness and able to be back among us. We want to lift Carrie's mother, Pam, up to you this morning as she is in the ICU. We just ask that you would strengthen her body that her kidney function might return and that she also might be able to turn a corner and be back on a path to feeling more fully herself. And then we just wanna surround Connie and Dan and Edna and the whole family with your peace, with your grace and with your love as they have said goodbye to Ron this past week. Um, we ask again that you would grant us the grace to be a source of help, a source of love and a source of friendship in a difficult time. God, we bring all these things before you right now because we know how much you love and care for us. And so it is in a spirit of hope and a spirit of grace that we pray together as Jesus taught his disciples so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're gonna close our prayer time by singing the first two verses of Once in Royal David City.
Well, that beautiful hymn we just sang actually began its life as a poem. It was written by a woman named Cecil Francis Alexander. She lived in Ireland. She was the wife of a clergyman, and she was a prolific poet, writing particularly for children. We don't know exactly what year she wrote once in Royal David City, but we know it was first published in 1848. She also wrote the text of All Things Bright and Beautiful, a hymn with which you may be a little more familiar. Now, a year or so after it was published, the English organist Henry John Gauntlet discovered that poem and decided that he wanted to set it to music. Gauntlet was a bit older than Miss Alexander. He was an active organist at several significant churches in Britain. And apparently inspired by the beautiful text of Once in Royal David City, he wrote what became the most famous hymn tune of his career. The combination of that text and tune, written by two different individuals, a man and a woman, from two different countries over a year apart, was the memorable combination that is still sung all over the world today. Since 1919, King's College Chapel in Cambridge has begun its Christmas Eve service every single year with Once in Royal David City as the processional hymn, making this Christmas the 102nd year that that hymn opened their beautiful service. Over its lifespan, Once in Royal David City has been recorded by Mary Chapin Carpenter, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, Petula Clark, Jethro Tull, and most recently by the Irish group Celtic Woman. It occurs to me that this hymn might well never have become so popular if Ms. Alexander had written her poem and Mr. Gauntlet had never come along and set it to music. Likewise, perhaps Mr. Gauntlet would never have written such an inspired melody if he hadn't come across Cecil Alexander's beautiful text. There's no record that the two of them ever met each other, and we don't even know if Ms. Alexander liked the tune that Mr. Gauntlet selected for her poem because she didn't have any say in the matter. So often, the very best and most beautiful creations happen when we send our best efforts, part of ourselves, out into the world and allow them to be changed or expanded upon by others. Many of our favorite hymns have come to us by the hand of more than one person, a poet and a musician, an author and a songwriter. I think sometimes we want to be the whole package. We want to be in control of all the aspects of our projects and our lives. It can be hard to share our creativity and trust other people to shape and change it with a vision that may be a little different than our own. This affects our life together as a church, too. It can be hard when we have a great idea or a pet project to put it out there for others to contribute and influence. I think it's one of the great gifts of this congregation that when we take something on, so many different people contribute and provide support. I think it's always something to keep before us, that we must be willing to bring our best ideas and our best creativity, share those gifts with one another, and then trust each other to collaborate and make positive changes and contributions. Most often it is through our combined effort that our projects and our endeavors become truly memorable and a lasting part of our legacy. We're gonna move now into our gospel reading. It comes this morning from the second chapter of Luke. And I will acknowledge that we're jumping just a little bit ahead in the story. This is that one little glimmer we have of Jesus as a child, as a young person in the Gospels. Now every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days of looking, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, 
Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. Jesus said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Whether the author intended it or not, the first thing I get from this passage is a reminder that there is always tension between the home we desire, the world as it should be, and the home we inhabit, the world as it is. I think Jesus must have experienced that too and would have understood our human experience in that respect. For Jesus, it manifested as a tension between where he truly felt at home in the temple and his actual home with his parents in Nazareth. In this story, we would have to concede that even Jesus doesn't get to just stay in the temple indefinitely where arguably he would like to be. He has to return to the real world, if you'll permit the phrase. He must go home with his parents, grow in wisdom and favor, as the text puts it, and allow life to unfold in due time. This tension can be tough for us to manage, too. We all have a sense of how we would like our lives to be, how we would like our families to be, how we would like our communities to operate, how we would like the world to look. But the simple reality is that we have no choice but to inhabit the world as it is. We can waste an awful lot of time and energy wishing for things to be different rather than making the most of and learning as much as we can from the circumstances in which we find ourselves. I'd like to read you a few sentences of a commentary by a woman named Vilmarie Cintrone Alvieri. She writes, I can imagine a young Jesus annoyed at being found, so soon taken away from a place he had claimed as his own, his father's house. For all the worry that a lost Jesus caused his parents, these precious moments at the temple with other generations of teachers were time well spent. I wonder if, as the church, we are cognizant of the impact we have on young lives during their formative years. Are we providing space for authentic relationships to develop, intergenerational or otherwise? End quote. Instead of focusing on the tension between Jesus' desire to remain at the temple and his parents' desire to take him home, Ms. Olivieri wonders what Jesus learned from that time at the temple. She imagines he made the most of the time he had with the faith leaders of his day, and it shaped the person he became. From a young age, it seems Jesus learned to live in the world as it was and make the most of the opportunities he had. Our next carol asks us to jump around a little bit in terms of the way we tell the Christmas story. The first Noel, if we sang all the verses, actually tells the story of the wise men who journeyed from far away to visit Jesus as he lay in the manger. Epiphany is officially this Friday, and we are going to observe it next Sunday, January 8th. But the first two verses of this carol point us toward that story. In a sense, the legend of these wealthy travelers points to that tension between the world as it is and the world as we wish it could be. On one side, we have Mary giving birth in a pile of straw without so much as a proper roof over her head. That feels like the world as it often is. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have this story about magi bringing expensive gifts that were well suited to a king. That feels like the world as we wish it was, a world in which people are honored and valued in which we're willing to go out of our way for each other, a world in which hopes and dreams and principles outshine raw expediency. One of the things I truly love about the Christmas story is that it is not afraid to live in both places. So many aspects of the story are raw and real, the world as it is, and yet so many aspects of the story dare us to dream of the world as God intends it. So we're going to sing now together the first two verses of the Epiphany Carol, the first Noel, number 245 in your hymnal.
move now to a time of responding to the word. One of the ways we do that is by the sharing of our tithes and offerings. Kylie, if you wouldn't mind walking the plate down for us, that would be helpful. But I'll remind you always that financial giving is just one of a lot of ways that we respond to the presence of the Holy Spirit. So as we sing together our offering song this morning, which is How Great Our Joy, I will invite you simply to be present to the movement of the Holy Spirit in your own heart in whatever form that might take. Let's, let's stand together and we'll fast forward in the slides, Charlie, to our prayer of dedication. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we have traveled together toward the guiding star of your grace. As our life journeys continue, help us consider the best way, the next step in our shared journey of faith. Wherever the spirit is leading, we know we are loved and we know you are with us. Accept our gifts and ourselves and use us that others might also see the star of your grace in their own lives. Amen. seated. African American spirituals are a folk genre that developed during the period of slavery in the American South. These songs were written, though not often written down, then sung and shared widely during the last few decades of the 1700s up until slavery was abolished in 1865. It's believed that the term spiritual comes from a translation of Ephesians 5.19 that reads, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. In Africa, music was central to people's lives, but white colonists in North America found the slaves' style of worship wild and idolatrous. For this reason, and for others as well, slave gatherings were largely banned and they often met and worshiped in secret. In the 1870s, Fisk University created a group known as the Jubilee Singers, consisting of former slaves. The truth is that some African Americans associated these spiritual with the slave tradition and were not all that enthusiastic about singing the songs. But the work of Fisk University and the Jubilee Singers went a long way toward convincing many of them that this musical form should be preserved and celebrated. The Jubilee singers didn't only perform spirituals and bring them into the mainstream. These performances were made possible because their faculty and their choir directors 
worked tirelessly to compile and track down and complete and write down songs that had been shared in secret slave communities for so many years. John Wesley Work Jr. attended Fisk University where he organized singing groups and studied Latin and studied history, graduating in 1895. He also studied at Harvard University, eventually taking an appointment as a Latin and history instructor at Fisk in 1904. With his wife and his brother, John Wesley Work began collecting slave songs and spirituals, publishing them in volumes that he released in the early 1900s. One of those volumes included the very first publication of Go Tell It on the Mountain, which he may have helped compose and complete. Though we can't know the precise origins of this jubilant Christmas carol, we have John Wesley Work Jr. to thank that we are able to sing it as part of our Christmas celebrations. Many scholars now regard spirituals as a form of protest song. It's hard to find hard evidence one way or another as people couldn't keep records of their intentions or the spirit behind each song or carol. But in his book, My Bondage and My Freedom, Frederick Douglass wrote of singing spirituals during the years of his captivity. He said, a keen observer might have detected in our repeated singing of, O Canaan, sweet Canaan, I am bound for the land of Canaan, something more than a hope of reaching heaven. We meant to reach the north, and the north was our Canaan. Based on testimony like that, we can hear the words of hope and liberation in many of the African-American spirituals that we still sing today. The experience of black Africans in the history of this country has been unique in the worst sense, and those of us who are white will never fully understand or empathize with their suffering. However, we can draw inspiration from their words, which stand as a challenge to those of us who, frankly, have it much easier and yet seem much less inclined sometimes to sing out with words of hope and celebration. I take it as a challenge to my faith to remember that men and women caught in the scourge of slavery still found the strength of spirit to write, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell the hopeful, wonderful, liberating news that Jesus Christ is born. Seen in its proper context, this cheerful sounding carol is a profound testimony to the resilience of human beings and to the opportunity we each have to proclaim good news even in the midst of hardship. If those trapped in slavery could do so, how much more should we be singing and proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ is born? Will you stand with me as you're able and let's sing together, Go Tell It on the Mountain. a few announcements for you this morning. 
The fact that you are here means you already figured out the first one, which is that our worship services have moved to 11 a.m. So well done. And if you showed up at 1030 this morning, I'm not going to tell anybody. That's okay. Nobody did. A very smart, very smart crew. So we will continue at this new worship time of 11 a.m. going forward. And I do want to remind you that all of our Sunday school will start back up next Sunday, January 8th. So our adult education study with Jeff, uh, I will check in, Ron and Sandy, is yours still ongoing? Okay, that continues as well. And our Sunday school for children and youth, but all of those things are moving to 10 a.m. to keep them in the same proximity to the 11 a.m. service. So just be aware of that. I wanna just let you know that we've got a Bibles and Brews coming up here in about a week and a half. So Wednesday, January 11th, we do have Bibles and Brews. I noticed in the newsletter this week that the denomination, the Christian church, is offering a winter retreat for high school youth at Camp Christian in late February. So if there is a high school young person in your life who you think might benefit from a time away and meeting some other friends from across the denomination, I just wanted to share that opportunity with, it, with you this morning. And you'll see the details of that in your emails as they come out this week. Finally, I do want to let you know that there will be a service for Connie's father, Ron. It'll be here on Saturday at noon and some help is needed with setup on Friday evening and then also with serving the meal um, after the noon service on Saturday. So Connie, would it be okay if people want to help out if they would contact you directly? Is that okay? Uh, if you'd be willing to help out with that and we will be here on Saturday to celebrate Ron's life. With those announcements before you, I am simply gonna invite you this morning to go in a spirit of peace and I wanna just wish you once again a very happy new year, amen.